So we do our ratings on a scale of 1 to 10. Well, two scales of 1 to 10. But I want to add a third one right now. On a scale of 1 to 10, how high do you think the screenwriter was when he wrote this movie? Oh, my God. Uh, 14? Yeah, it has to be above 10 because (laughs) I unfortunately didn't watch this high. And I think because of that, it was almost unbearable for me. Well, spoiler alert for your ratings. Yeah. But you didn't you see this when you were in high school? No. I don't understand how. Like, they came out, so for context, this comes out, I believe, like, early 2000. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it came out uh, on f***ing 420, because why not? Yeah. Uh, but, like, we would have been in grade uh, grade 11 or grade 12. Yeah, it would have been prime time for us to watch this. Uh, I used to go to the theater to see all of the teen, like, comedies and dramedies or whatever. Yeah. But for some reason, this one was just... I knew about it, but never had an urge to see it. I don't think I like Ashton Kutcher. I was a That 70s Show fan, but I hated that character, and I felt like that's what he was going to be in this movie, too. But what about Stifler? Everyone oh, I love Stifler. Stifler. Yeah. I love the American Pie movie, so it would have been something where... But he, like Stifler was not a big enough draw for me to go beyond it star, also starring Ashton Kutcher. Yeah, Sean William Scott, as he's known professionally. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we talking about? Oh, yeah, so today... If you can't piece this together, it's April 20th, it's 420, and we thought it would be good to uh, watch some kind of like stoner comedy because, you know, very fitting. And so we are talking about, dude, where's my car? Oh my God. <laughs> and, what I, and what I like right off the bat, uh, I like a movie that when you hear the title, you know exactly what it's going to be about. And that's what this is. <laughs> yeah. Right away. Yeah. It doesn't take long into the movie either for them to uh, get to the title. So uh, yeah. I know that you're going to appreciate that too. Oh. Except the intro uh, is a little bit out of this world. Yeah, I was going to say the opposite, actually. We'll, we'll talk about this in just a second. But first, we always make a beer connection uh, for the yes. movie. And forget that. what do we have today? We're going to be drinking the 420 Extra Pale Ale. Uh, this is from Sweetwater Brewing Company. They're out of Atlanta, Georgia. So we got an American yeah. uh, beer here. International offering. I like that. Uh, right on the can, it says, don't float the mainstream. So you know that oh. uh, <laughs> this uh, brewery is sort of all about doing something a little bit different. The website says it was two guys uh, in college they met, and they had a greater love of beers than they did for books. So uh, it sounds like... Sounds like like me in college. Yeah, it sounds like most uh, most people in college, but these two turned it into a brewing company. They have a huge festival every year called the 420 Festival. They have tons of bands and uh, drink lots of beer, and I'm sure other activities happen along with it. I think this one is actually referring kind of both to the road and to, well... 420 when everyone gets high that's right and so a good connection for today's movie i am excited to give this a shot it's not an india pale ale so i feel cautiously optimistic although the extra does make me a little nervous why don't we uh, crack this open and see how it is yeah i like it so after the 20th century fox fanfare we open with the disclaimer that the following story is based on actual events which there's no f- way right yeah i wrote that down i was immediately like what the (laughs) because we're gonna find out very quickly that this story goes in some uh pretty fun directions well it could be like partially based on a true story like put it this way i'm sure that uh someone lost a car at some point but i don't know if that's the only truth in this whole movie oh that's fair i'm sure someone or well lots of people get wasted and forget where their car ended up the night before like that that i believe the rest of the shit that goes along with this yeah well speaking of we launch into a sort of like flying through space credit sequence. You mentioned that it was kind of out of this world that features hot dancing ladies, muscle men, a bunch of ostriches for some reason, and a shitty late 90s CG lady cat, all set to an extremely era appropriate song. The music in this, starting here, took me right back to high school. <laughs> That's funny. Yes, it definitely does. Um, I think it's Smash Mouth. No, I don't. Well, I think it is sort of like a deep cut Smash Mouth song. I kind of felt like this whole soundtrack was not them, but it almost felt like it was organized by them. Like they were the ones who got to choose the songs. <laughs> Sorry, and that Smash Mouth did, or that yes, Ashton Kutcher no, and Smash, Scott did. Well, no, I felt like Smash Mouth. I felt like they asked Smash Mouth to do this. Is with no actual like this knowledge is an of incredible how incredible hot take. This I don't is, know where, this where is coming from. Purely right now. a. Uh, based on the songs that were played and the fact that it both opened and ended with Smash Mouth, I felt like 
Wait, we're not we're not sure this actually uh, is I Smash think Mouth. It is. I think it is. But you you are coming way out of left field on this. The producers <laughs> of Dude Where's My Car just handed the keys to Smash Mouth and were like, "Go ahead, do put the some sound." Songs in I feel like that's what happened. That First is the only time. That's yeah, like, yeah, I'm sure this is going to be a statue for me about uh, mistakes on the podcast. But yeah. that was that was the feeling I had on this one. We gotta find if there's a statue of the guy from Smash Mouth. That can be your <laughs> things Nolan was wrong about. Embarrassing yeah. Instagram <laughs> post. I yeah. like it. Uh, a ringing alarm clock rouses Ashton Kutcher from his peaceful slumber, and an insert graphic tells us his name is Jesse. From there, the camera tracks out of his room to find his best friend Chester, that's Sean William Scott, who also gets a graphic, watching Animal Planet. Ashton joins him on the couch, and the two of them try to piece together what happened last night, because as we can gather, they were extremely wasted and seemingly aren't that smart to begin with. Oh, and uh, also a third roommate, Gene, is there. Yeah, this guy comes out of a closet. Uh-huh. Um, Which, and- by the way, is not like a walk-in closet. It is like a standing closet. Oh, yeah. So he must be in there just vertical at all times. Yeah, he's just standing in a closet. He comes out, and he pisses on a mostly dead plant and then goes <laughs> back into the closet. And they suggest, like, they say hi to him, and then they say that they're going to see him again tomorrow. Yep. Also, neither of them know where he yeah, came no, from. They, I, don't know. I thought he was your friend. Is what yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> and it just seems so weird. Like, was this a chance to get somebody on the crew into the movie because they thought it would be funny to have them in there? Or do you think this was... I, I kind of thought this was just the first volley in a long series of just random moments because what we have here, we just have an absurdist stoner comedy where they're going to have to play hangover detectives in between a series of increasingly bizarre wipes. The The wipes from shot to shot here are like... I can't even describe some of them. One's like a kind of like a bubbling thing, and then one later on, it's almost like staticky. I've never seen wipes like this before or since. It felt like a bad take on Wayne's World in terms mm. of the transitions to me. Like it, it, I felt like Wayne's World had some creative wipes and movement between, and it felt like a bad job of doing that. I could see a connection there for sure. Uh, their first clue in this little odyssey is a fridge and cupboard completely full of pudding. <laughs> <laughs> but more clues come in quick succession. There's an angry message from their girlfriends, known as the twins, complaining about how the party they threw got trashed by the guys and their uninvited guests, followed up by their boss showing up to yell at them about 30 undelivered pizzas. Apparently they work in a pizza place. And their boss's name? Mr. Pizza Coley. I, I did not <laughs> enjoy this Pizza Coley oh my uh, God. character. Kind of a stereotypically angry black person. When he comes to sort of like yell at them for not delivering 30 pizzas and tells them that he's going to find out, they have this really silly scene where they throw <laughs> the pizza on the roof. Yeah. And then eventually, like slowly, the pizzas are falling from the roof and they have to distract him by saying <laughs> stupid shit is outside. And then they catch it and throw it away. It's a unicorn. One of the ones is a unicorn. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then in- inevitably, once he leaves and says he's going to catch them, he knows it's them. The pizza falls from the roof. They catch it and eat it. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And so you know very quickly how this movie is going to roll. They're setting the tone early and often. Yeah, for sure. And now this is where the movie really kicks into high gear because although we're only seven minutes in, this is where the plot really comes into focus. Our main characters decide to go see the twins because not only did they cause their house to be trashed, but today is also their anniversary. And when they walk outside, they are stunned. Stunned, I tell you, to find that Jesse's car is not there. Dude, where's my car? Where's your car, dude? Dude, where's my car? Where's your car, dude? Dude, where's my car? Where's your car, dude? I love it. I was so happy right then. And they say it so many times. This was a a plus three for you right here, just because they said it so many times. But I did enjoy it. Um, What is clear really quickly is you know what the plot of this movie is now. Like they're not they're not hiding anything. It's very obvious. (laughs) Like you didn't know coming in though. Well, you you do kind of. But now we have two guys who are on a huge bender who need to find their car so that they can find the present they bought their girlfriends for the anniversary, and get f***ed. Yeah, that's exactly right, because uh, the twins were going to give them some special treats. And as they explained to us in no small amount of detail, special treats means sex. Well, yeah, I think Ashton Kutcher had to explain it to uh, <laughs> to our, yeah. our friend uh, yeah, and like several times before they grabbed it. I, it's really, really hard, the two of them. They're back and forth for me. I, you, oh, come on now. You really? You really need to be drunk or high to enjoy this movie, I think. I, I messed up <laughs> in, in watching yeah. this not at a time where that was likely to happen. That was a huge misfire by you. Yeah. yeah. Well, they decide to retrace their steps, 
But Chester suggests this will only work if they get into the same state of mind as the night before. So the first place they head is their friend Nelson's house. Uh, I guess he's the guy who's got most of the drugs. We they get their weed from him or something. Now they make it there, but only after both getting hit by some neighbor's cars. Yeah. <laughs> There's some ageist humor here uh, in some really bad physical comedy. They both walk out into the middle of the street to ask for a ride from some older neighbors. Who they see driving by, yeah. Yeah, they both get hit and get thrown onto the car. Yeah. And then, like, very quickly transition to both the car and them being fine. Yep. It's clear in the second one that the car's windshield is shattered. Oh, yes, yeah. Right? But when they switch back to the car driving away, the windshield is fine. (laughs) Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. This is not the type of tight continuity editing you expect from a stoner comedy. No, yeah. no, exactly. I was, uh, I don't know. And then they throw themselves off. There's a lot of cuts here from them, like, coming out of shot, getting thrown, like, bad physical yep. comedy into a spot, and it was not working. They didn't want to invest in, like, a full stunt, man. They just kind of did, like, we'll just have those guys jump into frame like they yes. just got. Yep. Yeah. When they get to Nelson's house, it turns out he is played by one of the original cast members of Mad TV. There's a 90s f-ing reference for you. And in addition to being a huge stoner with a huge stoner dog, he's also seemingly very into Eastern philosophy, like a Zen meditative thing. Uh, Picture Bodhi from Point Break with none of the looks or charisma. (laughs) That's this guy. (laughs) Yeah, this is the first of our problematic sort of Eastern references. Wait, how do you find this problematic? This guy is embracing a very, like, Eastern lifestyle. Yeah, like, but he's clearly Eastern an idiot. Asian. Like, he's he's the douchebag who's, like, trying to appropriate the culture. But he, we, yes, he's not yeah. made to be serious or positive. I don't know. I feel like they kind of make him a positive character in this. The listeners can't see my face right now, but I don't know how. I feel like, listen, there's going to be stuff for you to complain about later. Yeah. I don't think this is this the is one to the do This is the start it. of the appropriation, though. Like, if we're if we're thinking about it, there was a little bit of ageism in the earlier comedy, and now we're getting some appropriation here. How is them wanting to hit Sean William Scott and Ashton Kutcher's stoner characters with their car ageism? Well, no, the one woman did it intentionally. The other two did it because they were old and didn't pay attention. All right. All right. Well, anyway... After Nelson demonstrates his dog's love of weed, they decide to go eat, which leads us to one of the movie's most famous scenes. And here, I guess, is one of your examples of this. It's the Chinese drive through What happens next? Oh, they get into an argument with the person at the ordering desk of the Chinese food restaurant because she says... And then? Uh, gosh, I think that's about it. And then? No, that's it. And then? No, and then. I, I, that's, that's all I want. And then? <laughs> over and over again, and Ashton Kutcher can't uh, hold his rage. So he ends up smashing the ordering box, and they drive away. And then? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so, so we have some more Asian racism uh, here at the Chinese restaurant. This one I'll give you. I'll give you this one. This is definitely uh, not great. Nelson doesn't take kindly to them trashing the drive through speaker box or their problematic comments about the Dalai Lama, so he kicks them out of his car, but this is only a temporary setback as they spot local smoke show Christy Boner. Yes, you heard me. Boner. Yeah. And she gives them some more details about the night before. Apparently, they had a suitcase full of money they were throwing around, $500 of which they gave her in exchange for showing her hoo-hoos. Yeah, why do they use... Such immature nicknames for body parts in this movie. Because these guys are fucking dummies? Like, what yeah. are you talking about? Look at them. They're not mature people. Uh, she gives Jesse a reminder by putting his hand on her boob, which his reaction to this is super mature. He like, can't look at her. He's, like, giggling and, like, blushing. Uh, sadly, though, all this fun gets broken up by Jerry O'Connell's brother and his Jeep full of workout bros. <laughs> I knew it was an O'Connell. Oh, my God. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. yeah. You could tell an O'Connell from a mile away. Um <laughs> 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 oh, that's a fucking fun theory i like it's that. the ex-irish in that's me kind of, yeah. <laughs> um so it's interesting the groups of characters they show in here fit very much high school stereotypes right like you're getting the hot girls you're getting the stoners yeah now, now we've got the jocks coming in you're about to you're going to meet the nerds very shortly too this is them writing a high school comedy but for me, really struggling with how poor it's holding up. The the vibe you're giving off 
I think not having seen this in high school, you are really losing a big chunk of this right this here. This one was not intended to be written for uh, like a well, of course middle not. aged no, man, right? No. So I, I had trouble putting myself back into that frame of mind to to watch this, I guess, right? I guess like, and this is kind of what I was getting at. Like if, if you and I are both now like almost 40, mm-hmm. if at the time this movie came out, you had shown this to like a 40-year-old person, they would have seen 16-year-old or 17-year-old me like giggling about it and been like, you're a fucking idiot, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I think, I think that's yeah, fair. Yeah, that's fair. I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't divorce my perspective and age from it at this point, right? And which really changes my perspective on the movie. And I, 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 I am terrified to hear what your ratings are for this because I feel like this is going to be one of those ones where we are very far apart. <laughs> oh, I hope we make some people mad. Oh, man. So we've got another piece of the puzzle here. And when Chester finds a matchbook in his pocket from the kitty cat club, it gives them a fresh lead. Because after all, if two guys suddenly had a lot of money, where would they go? Answer. The strippers. To a titty bar. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so this is that uh, really bad graphic cat. Yes, she's the logo. And that's where we're off to right now. It's that cartoon lady cat from the opening credits. Yeah. So it's quick here. You, you know that there was actually some significance to that weird intro scene. And so I'm expecting to start seeing some like strange dancing women and some really like techno Euro dudes. Like I know this is coming now based on what we saw. And then maybe we might even see ostrich. Oh, yeah. So it's in a weird way, they're making a mystery for us, the audience, as well. Because now it's like, when are we going to find these things? What were those things in the credits? We're kind of mm-hmm. thrust into the same mental headspace as the characters. Now, speaking of the characters, they aren't sure they were actually there last night. But when one of the strippers identifies them as Mr. Jesse and Mr. Chester, putting some respect on their names, they get a standing ovation from the bar patrons and staff. Clearly, they made a big impression the night before, and they didn't know. This is kind of happening now with everyone they're running into in the town. Yeah, they've made a lot of encounters the night before, for sure. They're piecing it together here. They get there, and very quickly, Ashton Kutcher gets approached by one of the uh, adult dancers. Yes, it's a stripper named Tanya, and she invites him to the back for a special dance, while Chester gets his own special dance from eight strippers who dump jugs of water on their, uh, you know... Hoo-hoos. Yeah, sure. Exactly. (laughs) As they would say in the movie. Uh, Yeah, that one was funnier uh, in terms of Chester being really immature and just enjoying dancing with them. He was uh, breaking it down on the sort of dance floor with all of these women. Uh, But how about the scene with Ashton Kutcher? Well, I was going to say, Chester is clearly having the far superior experience because Tanya turns out to be a gender-challenged male, that's their words, who treats Ashton Kutcher to a homeless man's version of the crying game before demanding he find a suitcase full of money that they gave him last night or else. This transgender character is portrayed just awfully, right? Like, and in, in, so that we will laugh at it, right? Like, this is, yeah. this is something that you couldn't make that character today. No, it's, it's the classic, like, when I say homeless man's version of the crying game, they literally, like, pull up their dress to reveal like uh, it's like underwear that clearly has a dick and balls in it. And this causes him to like recoil, but he's surrounded by like mirrors because it's a lap. He's so everywhere he turns, there's a dick and balls and he's like freaking out. That does not age well for sure. If you want to try and defend it a little, at least they're unapologetic about their transgenderness. Oh, the character. Yeah. yeah. The character's not ashamed in any way, but the way that they masculinize the character in many ways it doesn't seem like someone who would be transitioning. I don't know. No, just the way no, they do right. it. Right? Like, and it is definitely not included to be inclusive. Like, it's no. not a thing where they're trying to, like, make sure that other perspectives are represented in the movie. They're doing it so we will laugh at this person because they're transgender. And that is that is very much a consequence of the era. Because no mm-hmm. one thought about these things back then. It wasn't even a consideration. They were routinely used as, like comedy you think of ace ventura pet detective einhorn is a man like you know there's so many crying game references it's just you know that was that was just kind of it was low-hanging fruit that that's exactly what it was right yeah and and i think that was one of my biggest problems with this movie i knew it was gonna be yeah everything is low-hanging fruit right like they they are not trying to do i mean i know it's a stoner comedy but um I really struggled, especially with this character and later 
they're, that, okay, they're so that around. actually, I will get to that, but that part I actually kind of enjoyed. All right, we're gonna, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll talk about it. It was just an interesting kind of like reversal that, that they leaned into it, whatever. Yeah. So after this is done, they finally make it to the twins' house where we see the disastrous remains of the night before. There's passed out bodies, empty cups, and other assorted garbage scattered all around the lawn. The inside of the house, however, has been thoroughly cleaned up by the very unimpressed twins. In fact, all that's left to do is take out the trash, which Jesse and Chester quickly offer to do as a way to defuse the situation. But there's a lot of it, and they make the classic mistake of trying to one-trip it, which turns out predictably bad in what I thought was actually a very relatable comedy scene. <laughs> come on, man. You tried to one-trip yeah, stuff before. Um, this does come off a little better. They have... They have these giant, like, they try to carry all of the bags of garbage out in in one kind of action. They have them all balanced between each other, and everything's going fine until they drop a bottle cap. And then, of course, they can't leave anyone behind, so... Sean William Scott says to let it go. Let yeah. it go. Ashley Kutcher doesn't want to. And I relate to that. You yeah. want to get it all. You want to no, put back in there. No, that is definitely a relatable feeling. What kind of annoyed me was how much they trashed the house <laughs> in the trying to pick it up. They get kicked out. They, we see another one of those shots where they fly into the cut and out onto the front lawn. Another thing bothered me about this scene, the twins not being twins. Well, they're, they're not identical twins. They could be fraternal twins. Uh, I guess so. I was expecting, when you're setting this up as twins, when they're talking about it and how excited they are. you waiting for the Olsons to walk out? Oh, that would have been awesome. Wasn't one of them dating Ashton Kutcher for a while? I, I mean, think he could so. have been able to actually swing that. Yeah, that yeah. would have been cool to me. I really wanted identical twins. I don't know why. Like, that was to me. I if, know why. We're going... <laughs> <laughs> Why? Yeah. yeah. Uh, All right. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh, okay. So yes, as you mentioned, they get tossed out. It's kind of a different angle of like the un- old Uncle Phil from Fresh Prince. We yes. throw jazz out, it was right? Exactly like that. Um, yeah. And once they get up, they are quickly grabbed and pulled into a van by what looks like a whole fleet of Bible salesmen. In actuality, they are members of a small cult who believe they are the recipients of extraterrestrial communication. They've been sent to find the guys by their wise and powerful leader, Zoltan. Zoltan. <laughs> because, Zoltan. Yeah, there we go. Because in addition to all the other events of last night, apparently Jesse and Chester acquired something called the Continuum Transfunctioner, a mysterious, powerful device whose mystery is only exceeded by its power, as we're going to hear about 17 times in the rest of this movie. My God. Come on. Uh, I, again, it's funny because I probably laughed more at the stuff that was happening around the nerd characters okay. than, I, than I did with any of the others. But There's that's some good stuff in there, man. Probably also not okay, right? Because they are oh, like ridiculous stereotypes. What I was very excited to see was Gail the Snail was right, one of yeah. the nerds. Um, so it was fun to see her in that spot, in that character. Uh, and then we meet Jeff. I was going to say, I like, <laughs> I like that they all had Z names in honor of their leader, Zoltan. Zoltan. <laughs> uh, except for Jeff. They go through yeah. all these like Zed names and then yeah. it's like, and Jeff. And yeah. I, I love that Jeff is the keyboardist, by the way. That was, oh, the f- <laughs> that's great later on. Yeah, for sure. So um, they end up dropping Jesse and Chester off outside of a Chinese tailor. It says it right there on the sign for some reason, which brings us to the most famous part of the movie. See, the tailor has some custom suits for them, track suits, naturally. But when they go to try them on, they spot each other's fresh new back tattoos and hilarity ensues. Dude, what does mine say? Sweet. What about mine? Dude, what does mine say? Sweet. What about mine? Dude, what does mine say? Sweet. I actually laughed at this scene. Everyone did. I recall when I was in high school, uh, the girl I was dating at the time, her mom was like one of the least funny people I've ever met in my life. Terrible sense of humor. (laughs) Just like a real, no, I'm serious. Like not at all. Like whatever. And apparently Uh, she, this was like in all the previous movies and she found this like laughing her ass off. This like, this like 40 something woman with like no sense of humor. Found it hilarious. It's a funny scene. You're describing me right now, right? Um, (laughs) (laughs) exactly. Yeah. Um, with the amount of trouble I'm having so far enjoying this movie, this scene I really enjoyed. There you go. I liked the so it's kind of like a who's on first, right? Yeah, like we're throwing it, it back exactly to a who's on is. first, right? It's a really stoned version of who's on first. And and I like that. I like the reference. It went well. And I actually like the Taylor character. Well, that came out of left field. I was expecting that. I like the way he the facial expressions and the way he treats them when they're being dumbasses is yeah. pretty good. And that this scene pulled it together for me. This was one of the few in here that I, I quite enjoyed. And they go along with it for just the right amount of time. Not too long to overstay its welcome. Yeah. Not too short. There's really land. Like they go right perfect. And it's the tailor who makes the timing work perfect, right? Yeah. He cuts them off yeah. at the perfect time, calls them both like boneheads or idiots. Which or they something. are, 100%. Yeah. And uh, so they have these new sweet Adidas suits. 
And then we're going to get into some ref appropriation. All right. So the tailor <laughs> happens to mention the secret pockets he included in the suits. And not only do they find cell phones in there, but also a live dove, a Rubik's Cube, and the lease to a brand new convertible, which leads us to like a weird montage slash music video set to the sweet sounds of Bust a Move. And I'm assuming you had a lot of problems with the sequence. A ton of problems. <laughs> not that I dislike the Bust a Move song. Um, great song. But it... They basically insert themselves into the role of, like, 90s, 2000 rap stars um, and into their videos. I think there's even cornrows and, like, lots of do-rags. I didn't see cornrows, of, but Sean William Scott definitely has a grill in or something like yeah, that at one they, point. Yeah, it's really, really appropriation. It's funny because after the movie, you there's, like, an outtake scene, and you can see them recording this one. And this is definitely one of those moments where the two actors had some of the most fun, like, as a part of the movie in well, this whole section. Like, they were loving themselves while they were doing Why wouldn't you this. be? Dude, I fundamentally, mean, yeah. you're, you're dancing around a swimming pool with a bunch of hot ladies yeah, in bikinis and bikinis and, like, you know. And that's fair, right? Like, I kind of understand why they included it. It just felt a little bit off to me I, and i think that's time and place like it probably oh yeah i guess overall this it, i love montages and this was not one for me this was one that i struggled through right after this we get a quick fabio cameo google it kids and a good old-fashioned red light rev off and because it's the late 90s early 2000s it rapidly devolves into homophobia <laughs> yeah they make Fabio and his girlfriend seem very homophobic because uh, they sort of rev at each other and then put arms around each other. Well, Fabio puts his arm around his like hot girlfriend, and it's only Ashton Kutcher and Sean William Scott in the car, so uh, he puts his arm around Sean William Scott. And then Fabio starts yeah. making out with his girlfriend, and then uh, Ashton Kutcher doesn't hold any punches here. He climbs over and starts making out with Sean William Scott. Yeah, but then Fabio and his girlfriend are disgusted and drive away. Yeah, so yeah. so they're clearly homophobic. Sean William Scott and Ashton Kutcher clearly win this one. They win gay chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they definitely do. No time to dwell on that, though, as the guys are planning their next move when a team of five hot chicks, their words arrives to ask them some questions about the Continuum Transfunctioner. These were the ladies featured in the opening credits, and something about the way they're talking makes me think they might not be from around here, if you know what I mean. Also, one of them d a popsicle to completion. <laughs> <laughs> this was a very long popsicle, and she, she takes the whole thing down. In one gulp. Yeah, like this oh, is she gobbles it up. <laughs> and then we start getting... Um, them offering pleasure to the boys. Oral pleasure. Definitely oral is the, the main <laughs> pleasure they're offering to them. This is giving me uh, vibes of Species or uh, other alien movies. What's the one we watched in the first season? Uh, Life Force? Yes. So we're oh. getting sexy alien yeah. vibes, Life Force vibes off right now is kind of what I'm getting from these women. Oh, that They're... sexy alien was way sexier than these aliens. Oh, well, that's fair. You would have given up uh, all want, humanity on for that. Yeah. R.I.P. Earth. Never tempt Cooper with sexy women is what I am learned. not the guy to yeah. send into a sexy alien scenario if you want the human species to live. That's what we've learned from yeah. this podcast, if nothing else. <laughs> now, before the guys can take advantage of their offer to trade the continuum transfunctioner for oral pleasure, Tanya shows up demanding the money, and the cops are right behind them to drag Jesse and Chester in for questioning. Full disclosure, uh, I've been enjoying myself so far, but this scene is dumb as f***. Uh, yeah, this police scene sucks ass. It's really bad. So they're in a kind of police interrogation. Good cop, bad cop. Yeah, we've got the good cop sitting at the desk with the two of them explaining that there was something that went down last night that they are suspects in. Between midnight and 2 a.m. Yeah, and then we have another cop, a more menacing one, one that looked familiar. I think he's been a bad guy in quite a few movies. I don't recognize yeah. him, I don't know. And he wheels over a dummy and starts torturing it. <laughs> he's punching that dummy. And so they're trying to intimidate them, but they're too dumb and or stoned to have any answers to what happened the night before. And this is starting to frustrate the police. But luckily for Chester and Jesse, what happens? Oh, a different police officer walks in with some whips to really take this interrogation to the next level, but recognizes Jesse and Chester as the guys who bought donuts for the entire precinct last night, sometime between the hours of 12 and 2. So they can't be the guys. It was a case of mistaken identity. And not only that, the police have found their car. Now, unfortunately, a dim-witted officer named Rick impounds their car instead of releasing it. So the movie continues. <laughs> Keep going. 
This Rick character sucks ass. He's not great. Really, really bad. They give him like giant bubble glasses. He looks like bubbles from Trailer Park Boys. Yeah. And they make him absurdly incompetent. They do not make the police look very effective in this movie either. This is another one of those like bumbling stereotypes. The suspects who uh, they actually caught. <laughs> yeah, how do you feel it's, about it's that? A, I'm fine with it. It looked nothing like uh, Ashley Kutcher and Sean William Scott. One of them's like a f***ing, like tall dude with muscles and like a tank top. He's bald. The other one's like a little person, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's just, I don't know. There's another low-hanging fruit joke as we go through. This is ridiculous. But those hot chicks from before are looking all over town for Jesse and Chester. And when they can't find them at Mr. Pizza Coley's restaurant, they enlist the services of Jerry O'Connell's brother and his gang of buff stoner bashers. They also harass the twins where they work, which apparently is like a school or camp for blind kids. This scene is hilarious. <laughs> so we start making fun of abilities as well, or no, using no, them no, for no, humor. No, 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 hold on. Oh, making fun of that blind kid gets to grab that woman's cans, and she just like he says the way that blind people shake hands. <laughs> <laughs> and there's like a bunch of dick shots on the one guy. It's a funny scene. So we go to this camp for the blind where the twins work. Clearly, they're angels. Um, and one kid's starting to learn how to play baseball, and the other guy is telling him to listen for the ball. Yeah, the like, ball emits like a tone or something. Yeah, well, his phone rings right beside his crotch, and the kid hears it and nails him in the d- <laughs> Kind of d- humor's always funny it's whenever funny. someone gets Come hit. The d- so there's a little yeah. bit of a chuckle there, but then we, we pan over to those five hot aliens yep. showing up to a boy who's reading in Braille. They talk to him, and he asks if he can use his hands to tell what they look like because that's how they do it. And they're <laughs> aliens. They don't know. So he starts feeling her face, and he says, you are beautiful. And yeah. his hands trail down to her breasts. Is this normal? Oh, yeah. This is how blind people shake hands. But also, uh, the guy who got hit in the dick with the baseball bat he goes walking by. There's like a slip and slide, and the plant gets a slip and slide, and the kid's foot is up in the air, and also kicks him in the d- again. Listen, I'm not saying this is mature comedy, but it's f-ing enjoyable. Anytime someone gets returned, d- it's hilarious. Two in a row, right, and yeah. that's a funny scene. Also, that blind kid taking advantage of those hot aliens. That's humorous <laughs> to me. Good for him. He's had a hard life. He uh. deserves it. So once this scene wraps up. The guys meet the keepers of the Continuum Transfunctioner, which is two German muscle men in pleather tops from the opening credits. <laughs> <laughs> These guys need a moment to themselves. This is what I yeah. described earlier as the sort of like industrial techno dudes. These, yeah. these guys are straight out of craft work. Very much a European industrial kind yeah. of look from the 80s. For Blonde. Sure. Yeah. The funny accents. Sorry. Funny to me. I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sure they were funny to the screenwriters, too, <laughs> who needed were. another stereotype. Oh, my God. This is like catnip for you. They end up uh, dispatching with these guys. They get them out of their way, and they head home to try to relax. But the second they sit down on the couch, the twins barge in and break up with them. So Jesse and Chester decide to go see if they can get the car out of impound, hoping that some anniversary gifts for the twins might possibly be inside. Yeah, so we head over to impound, and we get the presence of... Stereotypical black woman. (laughs) Yes, we do. (laughs) Add another stereotype to the list. Yep. Uh, The bad luck continues here as it turns out that not only did Officer Rick send their car to impound, he also tagged it to be sold at auction, which it was. They managed to get the address of the buyer from the aforementioned angry black woman. And after they send the keepers the continuum transfunctioner on a wild goose chase, Jesse and Chester start to head over to the buyer's home before being ambushed once again by the space cult. Yeah, there's a lot going on in all of these scenes. The woman who is working at the impound, she puts the sheet just out of reach for the address so that they will stick their hand under the glass, and of course they do. What happens is Sean William Scott's arm gets stuck, and he has to try to pull it out, and we get some really bad physical comedy where Ashton Kutcher is climbing all over him. And then the two of them just start spitting like crazy all over his arm. Uh, What does she do when she comes back to find his arm in there? Uh, She says that her supervisor actually said she can give them the address. But uh, because he reached through the glass, now she has to cut off his pinky. She She starts laughing maniacally. And pulls a switchblade out. Yeah. (laughs) She lives with Berkeley and Showgirls. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Taking... Taking a page out of the showgirls book, I guess. So after they get grabbed by the space cult, they wake up on a farm, and after dispatching the two members who are guarding them and disguising themselves in some sweet interstellar jumpsuits, they get to meet the one, the only, Zoltan. Zoltan. (laughs) 
So this is the nerds. Um, of course, um, Zoltan is sort of like a rich kid whose family has a big mansion, and he has his own barn. And he also has his own theme music. He comes out to a sweet keyboard intro, compliments of Jeff. Oh, I enjoy this. Um, and of course, Jeff keeps keyboarding because he's into the groove way longer than Zoltan <laughs> he's wants He's really into to. the groove. It's good. Yeah. yeah um, so this scene is actually kind of funny. Um, the fact that they're wearing like bubble wrap yeah. spacesuits and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. it is kind of fun to make fun of cults or new religious movements, right? Because they're so like out there, right? Yeah. It's people who believe stuff that is just like mind boggling to most people. So yeah. you kind of get that and, and enjoy that part of it. So Zoltan's kind of this rich younger kid who um, is looking to try to take all of these people on a space adventure very quickly when he's giving a speech this charismatic speech to all of his followers they recognize that jesse and chester are here in the room this scene actually kind of reminded me of that scene in specter you know the james bond movie where bond sneaks his way into the specter meeting and like halfway through ernst stavro blofeld just starts talking like to james bond and he realizes he's been found out but he's a couple steps ahead of them, though. As we find out, he has kidnapped the twins and demands a continuum transfunctioner in exchange for their release. Yeah, this like small, nerdy cult of people who want to go to outer space has moved into the kidnap game here. The girls are tied up in some cheap bubble wrap, which they could clearly get out of if they wanted to. Uh, they're also being held by some nerds with zero muscles that they could probably beat up in a second. This whole time that we're going through all of these events that we're seeing this, we get the Sean William Scott character playing with a what? Rubik's Cube. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh. constantly he has a Rubik's Cube in his hand, and clearly we know what that Rubik's Cube is. I admit that I did not until it comes out at the end, but that's just me. Very, very quickly, I recognize that this Rubik's Cube that he finds in his outfit is the thing that they're looking for. I'm like, okay, we know that the game is up here. We don't know that now. In the movie, we don't. But as the audience is watching it, if you're not, like, f***ing drunk or high, you know <laughs> what's happening here. But again, like, who would watch this without being drunk or high? I mean, it was a mistake. It, it was, was a, mistake. a bad mistake. <laughs> <laughs> if anything yeah. I've learned is don't try to watch a stoner comedy completely sober. Yeah, it's not a good move. No. Not in your late 30s. Um, they figure it's got to be in the car. So they head to the address of the guy who bought it at auction. And let's just say this guy's home is not exactly welcoming. There's a ton of signs warning against trespassing, including one threatening castration. And in brackets, it says, D will be cut off. <laughs> 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 this seemed like it was out of a cartoon. Yeah, right? yeah. Like this was pushing it so far that it seemed like it was out of a cartoon. <laughs> They, of course, ignore these signs and climb over the fence and find themselves in Jurassic Park. It does resemble Jurassic Park, only instead of dinosaurs, they find ostriches, a whole herd of them. Check that off the list, man. Yeah, we. so, so far from the... I think that's everything we've seen at that's that start of the movie, yeah. right? That was the last thing we were waiting for. Oh, that's a lie. Because there's an astronaut guy and he comes up later. Mm. Unsurprisingly, the ostriches quickly outfox them. And after being knocked unconscious, the guys wake up again, but this time in a cage. And in the cage next to them is Mark, played by the incomparable Andy Dick. And let me tell you, if you need someone to play a weirdo with undertones of disturbing sexuality, there's no better choice than Andy Dick. It's the role <laughs> he was born to play. Come on. <laughs> Andy Dick does a good job here. He does a great yeah. job. This scene is tremendous. He pulls this off. He tells us he's been there for a few years. You know, I've been in this cage for about three years, five months, and 17 days, but who's counting? <laughs> How's my breath? <sighs> that bad, huh? Um, and he used to model. <laughs> he looks, <laughs> looks like shit. Andy Dick <laughs> is got to be one of the best, like, appear for 30 seconds of your film characters. That's like, about as much Andy Dick as most people can handle. I well, think yeah. he's really funny. I'm a huge fan of his, and he is so perfect in these roles because there's just something inherently unsettling about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's his voice, the way he delivers it, or how self-deprecating he is, right? He's a perfect amount of self-deprecating. So of the kind of performances in this, this one definitely stands out. He's great. The one that doesn't, though, is our friend who's about to come in. Well, I was going to say, Andy Dick, not the only cameo in this scene, as the owner of the ostriches, and I guess Jesse's car now, 
is Brent Spiner, a.k.a. Lieutenant Commander Data from Star Trek The Next Generation. No. Yes, indeed. He's what? playing the role of Pierre, complete with a French accent. And I found him and Andy Dick riffing off each other while the two stoners act uncomfortable really enjoyable. That is kind of true. I just thought it was strange that they gave him a, like, they made him French. There's no reason for it. There's no, There's no reason, reason for, for him to it. be French. So they make him French. Uh, they're just trying to get like another foreigner accent in that we can laugh at. Yeah. Now, uh, he thinks they're there trying to poach his ostriches. But after Chester wows him with his ostrich knowledge gained from years of watching Animal Planet, Pierre apologizes for caging them, lets them out, and agrees to let them get their stuff out of the car. But when they three of them head to where the car was supposed to be parked, we see that it is once again mysteriously disappeared. They aren't leaving empty-handed, though, as Pierre did find a key to a storage locker from Captain Stew's space Arama, and that's where we're <laughs> headed to next. So we, we keep getting these little clues that are pushing the plot forward, and it, we're going to get to the resolution soon. We're almost there. I don't know. They make a lot of Animal Planet references in this movie. I guess that's what Sean William Scott likes to do when he's high. That's how we first meet him. He's watching Animal Planet, and he turns it on as soon as they get home in the earlier scene. And it's going to come up again soon. He needs to use his Animal Planet knowledge to uh, save the day as we get moving forward. But we're off now to maybe the best place to host a birthday party. When they get there, it looks like we're finally going to reach the end of this journey, like you said. They even get a little choked up before they open the locker. But Tanya pops up along with her boyfriend, Patty. And they open the locker to find Tanya's briefcase, thus finally saving us from more of this character. Also, a whole bunch of skee-ball tickets, a crazy straw, and two certificates proving that Jesse and Chester have become fluent in Japanese. And then they start speaking in Japanese. What the f***? I don't f- know. What the f***? <laughs> okay, hang on. There's so much to unpack in this. What about uh, Tanya's uh, boyfriend, Patty? Tanya's boyfriend, Patty, is a <laughs> small woman... With, with a mustache and beard drawn on. Now, hold on, though. That is a real thing. Where, except. Okay, go ahead. Except what happens after they give them the briefcase? Well, first of all, Patty speaks in a stereotypically, like, gruff, deep voice mm-hmm. and, like, shakes both of their hands in an aggressive, like, masculine way and also, like, laughs maniacally at different yeah. points. And then the two of them make out and the drawn on beard and mustache comes off. Get all over both but of them. But that's what happened. But they're doing that so that we'll laugh at transgender people, not because they're trying to, like, promote or pick up transgender people. Well, of course not. Clearly not. However, I have to say, the fact that they took that joke, which, again, for the time, it was a culturally acceptable joke. Common. Shouldn't be. Yeah. Shouldn't be, but at the time it was. To They kind of took it one step further by bringing in... it. it the, the Patty character is fundamentally ridiculous. But they are making fun of the fact that often oh, this, like, 100%, LGBTQ I'm not, people I'm not trying to argue that point. take like stereotypes of other genders. I'm just saying, from a strictly comedy standpoint, introducing mm-hmm. the original Tanya character and then bringing in this like much shorter, very like physically petite woman with a drawn on beard to play the role of the boyfriend. Just yeah. it, It's a logical extension yeah. of the comedy. No, they pushed it. Yeah, they pushed it to a spot where they thought, I don't know. I, I guess that character, the Tanya character is the one that bothered me the most in the movie. Oh, of course. Oh my God. Yeah. I had that a million. Like yeah. I would have bet all the money I had. I'm like, you know what? Most going to problem with pe- yeah. Tanya. Yeah. Tanya is the yeah. biggest problem in this movie by a hot mile. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and uh, their boyfriend, Patty is a close second, I suppose. So they've got all this stuff in there. They're speaking Japanese somehow, which yeah. is hilarious. But what about the continuum transfunctioner? It's not in there. It's not. But in a rare moment of clarity, Jesse realizes that nobody actually knows what the continuum transfunctioner looks like, or at least they haven't described it. So they use their ski ball tickets to buy a vaguely space age looking toy from the prize booth. Then, after summoning all of their enemies to one place, they try to trick them into fighting over it. Yeah, so we're getting all of our groups together here now. We've got the alien chicks, we've got the O'Donnell. And the his, two German guys, Kraftwerk, is yeah, there. Yeah, we've got yeah. Kraftwerk here, and we've got Nerd Crew, um, Zoltan. Zoltan. So everyone's here, and they give the transmographer, of course, to the nerds first because they want their girlfriends back, and they want to get f***ed. They sure do. The problem is the aliens know what the continuum transfunctioner looks like. They didn't piece that part together. Yeah. So as soon as the aliens show up, they're like, that's not it. So now it looks like Jesse and Chester are in trouble, except... It turns out that the Rubik's Cube that Chester has been playing with the whole time is the Continuum Transfunctioner, and it activates when he finally solves it. You saw this coming. There was no other reason for it to be in his pocket, right? He's clearly not smart enough. He doesn't know the algorithm for a Rubik's Cube, yet somehow he figures it out. 
which is bullshit, by the way. He would not be able to do that uh, if he you know, didn't you know the know strategy. That. What do I? What do you mean? I don't know that. Maybe he's good with like tactile stuff. Tactile doesn't matter. You need to know the algorithms of how to move a Rubik's cube to solve it. The algorithms. Yes. Someone could figure it out without knowing the algorithms. I'm sure in the history of time, someone has solved the Rubik's cube without it knowing the algorithms. It would take them longer than the hour and twenty minutes that this movie is to figure that out. Maybe he's a savant. Okay, maybe. But then, why is he high all the time? Because he likes fucking weed. I don't know. <laughs> all right, whatever. Anyway, they solved the Rubik's cube. It's a continuum transfunctioner. They've got it now. This is great news, right? You would think so, right? You would think it's awesome, except for when he finishes off the Rubik's Cube and it transforms into the... Uh, continuum Transfunctioner? <laughs> <Why'd you laughs> I don't know why I'm having some trouble yeah. saying this. The Continuum Transfunctioner, it starts basically a doom clock. Yeah, it's going to blow up the whole universe if they don't act quickly. The only people who know how to shut off the explosion that will destroy the whole universe are the true keepers of the Continuum Transfunctioner. I got it right that time. But we have both our Kraftwerk crew and our sexy aliens claiming to be the true keepers. So this is the problem now, is how did Jesse and Chester know who the true keepers are? But just then, Jesse figures out a way to tell who's telling the truth. He asks what score they got last night on the 18th hole of the mini putt course. The hot chicks pass to the Germans, who correctly answered that it was a hole in one. The mystery here is... If Jesse and Chester can't remember last night, then how did they know their score? Well, I'll tell you, the answer is hanging on the wall. A banner proclaiming that anyone who scores a hole-in-one on 18 receives a lifetime supply of pudding. And with that, we've come full circle. I actually like that resolution. There we go. Of course, we find out that Kraftwerk knows they, because of the pudding that they found in their house at the start of the movie, they determine correctly who it is who should be the keepers of the trench functioner. They laid that breadcrumb right from the beginning. Yeah, they throw it over to them. They're sort of like just seconds left, and they're able to diffuse this trans functioner. They do, so the universe is safe, but the five hot chicks morph into one giant, even hotter chick. Yeah, they Voltron starts- here. We get sort <laughs> of... <laughs> it's a sexy Voltron. Yeah. Yeah, who starts running amok. The keepers of the continuum trans functioner try to banish her to Hoboken, New Jersey, but quickly get knocked out. So Jesse and Chester grab it and run with the giant alien woman in hot pursuit. Time is running out. In order to stop her, they'll have to activate something called the photon accelerator annihilation beam. But the button is set deep within the continuum trans functioner, and a human finger is too large to press it. So it looks like they're screwed. But then, from deep within his consciousness, Chester flashes back once again to Animal Planet and how chimpanzees use sticks as crude tools. And then he remembers the crazy straw. <laughs> they have laid this all out, man. The pieces are right in front of us. He uses it to push the button, which launches the beam, which blows up the giant woman and saves the universe. And this is going to be a happy ending for literally everyone. The uh, the PC word for the straw is a swirly straw, just by the way. Oh, for f- it is offensive to use the words crazy technically for people um who struggle with mental (laughs) sometimes i wonder how we're friends like (laughs) like, literally as soon as you said it i knew i had to bring it up because i thought it would be fun you're Uh, just the wokest human on earth yeah you're welcome um (laughs) could we just spit his beer everywhere uh they have saved the day. <laughs> <laughs> the laser has has defeated the giant alien woman. Um, I will tell you, the two characters almost weren't able to pull it off, mostly because they were staring at the giant alien's t- hoo-hoos. Please. Oh yeah, I apologize. They would have said hoo-hoos. No man, it's good. The nerds get to go to space. Nelson ends up with Christine Boner. The twins get their anniversary gifts, including a very special one from the keepers of the continuing transfunctioner. It's a pair of necklaces that when put on cause their boobs to grow even bigger than they already are. Yeah, of course Chester and Jesse enjoy this. <laughs> we get some boob growth. What's the gift, the special gift that the twins give the boys though? Oh, it's the hats. Yeah, it's, it's the berets. It's berets, it's berets with berets. their names <laughs> stitched into it. Which is kind of hilarious. They think they're going to get fucked, but instead they get a beret with their name stitched on it, and clearly they are upset. Oh, clearly. But, well, they're not that upset because the movie ends with the four of them driving off to get Chinese food, and we walk back the dude sweet joke from the earlier tattoo scene. It's just a nice way to wrap things up, I think. Yeah, the tattoo joke coming back again isn't isn't bad because it was probably the moment in the movie that landed best for everyone. And that's it, man. We're out. We're in the credits, and as you mentioned, the credits feature kind of a gag reel with some, you know, hilarious actors breaking character, laughing, fun moments from the shoot. More Smash Mouth music. 
I'm not convinced that either of those songs were Smash Mouth. We can find this out very easily. You might be wrong with like four uh, different things. Oh my God, I, this might be my most shameful episode ever, and I'm okay with it. Let's just wait until the ratings come out. Then we'll see how shameful yeah, it is. Yeah, we're going to see. Um, I wanted to ask you a question because... You're like, going to ask me what shibby means, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, what the f*** is shibby? I guess it's just another way of being like sweet or something. I don't know. I, I really don't know. But we should probably slide into our ratings right now. So the way we do this, we rate the movie on a scale of 1 to 10. We do it two times. 1 to 10 for how bad it is, 1 to 10 for how enjoyable. And the goal is to find movies that hit a 10 or a 10 on both scales. What we call the Crit 20. 20. And for me, I will say this movie is not bad enough for me to give it the 10. Yes, this movie is extremely low budget. Yes, this movie is very poorly acted. Yes, these characters, depending on your personal philosophy, can be seen as a little bit unlikable. But... They're trying to make an absurd stoner comedy. They made an absurd stoner comedy. There's two things that are completely on point in this movie. Uh, number one, the soundtrack. Again, took me right back to that era. Number two, the casting. Try to imagine two better actors for this movie, because I can't. You're going to cast two guys as dumb stoners, Ashton Kutcher and Sean William Scott. Nailed it. In terms of a couple of like Seth dumb Rogen stoner Seth has to be the best stoner. He didn't look like a teenager when he was a teenager. Yeah, but he is definitely... They're not supposed to be teenagers in this, are they? Oh, whatever. Yeah, I guess, they're like, supposed whatever. to be young adults. They're not supposed to be teenagers. It's a movie for teenagers. This movie yeah. was made, Pineapple as you Express, super movie, bad, this, way better stoner comedies. Acting like stoners. I don't think you can find two better actors for this movie. I mean, I don't think Ashton Kusher can do anything else, so... You're negative on him, but in this role, he's perfect. It's a bad movie, don't get me wrong. But in terms of being for that target audience, I think they hit it pretty good, so I'm only even it an eight. I am sure you will have it higher. Go ahead and tell everybody. It's a f***ing 10. Oh, Jesus Christ. Absolutely right. a 10 bad. Having never seen this before and only watching it as a nearly 40-year-old definitely hurt. Having watching it sober definitely hurt my rating too. But despite that, as I think about other stoner comedies or other even comedies that take a similar vein. I love stupid comedy, right? I love that shit. But this is just fucking awful. The acting sucks. The plot was awful. The writing was bad. The humor was all stereotypes and low-hanging fruit. What I, about the who's that dude sweet? What about the tattoo scene? Who's on first? That's the only redeemable uh, moment for comedy agree. in this for me. I really, really struggled. I didn't like the music. What I thought- you, what? I love the 90s and early 2000s music, and for some reason, this fell super flat for me. It was not pulling together. I didn't oh, find... wasn't enough alt rock for you? Is that the problem? No, I love pop rock. I love some of the stuff that would have fit in here, but it just, I don't know. I didn't feel like it was time well. It didn't help with the mood of the movie. It didn't help with me enjoying it. So I really, really struggled. I had this down as a 10 bad. All right, well, uh, I guess it's in play. We have the possibility of a crit 20, except I know in my heart of hearts, there's no f***ing way you give us 10 for enjoyable. I absolutely did not. What do you have? How enjoyable is this movie? Yeah, so it was offensive. It was low-hanging. You cannot watch this movie sober. If you do, it is just absolutely awful. For a movie that is supposed to be like a stoner, hilarious comedy, this was made for 11 and 12-year-olds. This wasn't even made for teenagers, right? And so watching that like three times older than a teenage boy. It just did not come off for me. I really disliked it. It's a five. Okay, I will admit that's actually higher than I expected you were going to go. I laughed at the tattoo scene. <laughs> I enjoyed some of the connections from the intro and when they layer things that kind of went throughout the Animal Planet connections. And Andy Dick? The, Andy Dick was funny. I like that part. So there were moments that brought it out for me. Clearly, there were some funny people in this. I like Sean William Scott. I yeah. really do, um, especially in the American Pie series and in other things, in Goon. Uh, okay. Fucking awesome. Yeah. But um, Ashton Kutcher, I don't know, just doesn't do it for me. Maybe uh, like him being with Demi Moore makes me jealous. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, my God. That no. came out of nowhere. <laughs> no, I thought I'd throw that out there for the people who are on the, like, Nolan Loves Boobs uh, train, right? Because that's mm. pretty much what Demi Moore is known for. <laughs> wow. And, All right. Uh, but, no, this is a five for enjoyability for me. I will okay. never watch this again. Well, I knew that this was going to happen. We are, uh, we've got a pretty decent gap here between the two of us. Uh, I have this as an eight for enjoyable. 
God help me. Uh, I clearly have not aged emotionally since I was 17 years old because I found this funny then and I found a large part of it funny now. Just the fact that this was even made to me is so symbolic of the 90s. Like you mentioned going to see all the teen comedies and stuff in theaters. I just remember this endless stream of random movies in the 90s. Like people just like trying shit, you know what I mean? I just kind of miss that, man. I miss that feel of like, here's fucking 15 new movies like this week. Go see what's fucking good and what's not good. So in some ways... You like this more because it was someone who tried something that wasn't effective. Just that this would like, there's zero percent chance to go to theaters today. Oh god, never no, happen. Absolutely, wouldn't touch it. So I miss that yeah. era of just like pumping stuff out and trying to make your money through actual ticket sales versus whatever. I do like that perspective. Just for me, someone watching this for the first time when it is clearly not intended for me, and because it ages so poorly. There's so many movies that would come out from a similar time period that wouldn't seem so offensive or so stereotypical right now. Let's do a little movie face-off right now. What would you rather watch, this or Can't Hardly Wait? Can't Hardly Wait. That's f***ing stupid. I'd rather watch this. Really? 100%. Oh, no. I would much rather watch Can't Hardly Wait. This or American Pie? American Pie. Of course. Yeah, that, by, that by one's for sure. By a million miles. Yeah. By a million miles. What else was around then? Uh, I'd rather watch She's All That. I'd rather watch... Well, She's All That's not a comedy. No, but it's like a teen dramedy. I'd rather watch any of those like kind of teenage, like angsty, whatever movies rather than watch this. Well, you just want the angst. That's all. Well, I am emo. You're not about the good time. You want the angst. Yeah, I want the feelings. You're right. That's why I love You're like that f***ing guy with the stoner dog in this movie. That's you in high school. Eastern mysticism, all philosophical and stuff. Not just having a good time. Well, I didn't want to be culturally appropriate. Like, I didn't want cultural appropriation, (laughs) but yeah. No, this is the guy who pretended to be Irish for the first f***ing 40 years. (laughs) (laughs) That's a bit of a deep, deep cut right there. I'm sorry. That's a bit of a... (laughs) I apologize. That was uncalled for. No, I enjoyed this. I thought it was funny. Uh, Andy Dick was delightful. Many times I laughed. What I could see is that people who were in this and or who wrote on this, I could see them going on to make good things later. If that makes sense. No, like there's, there's, you, you there's, can, there's hints in here. You of, can of craft. see yeah. potential in this, but because so much of it relied on the stereotypes and low-hanging fruit for me, it just did not deliver. Well, that was always going to be the biggest obstacle for you. So we are, we are pretty far apart again. Uh, enjoyed by me, not so much by you. How about this beer, though? This will bring us a little closer together, I think. Oh, I think there's going to be a much better response to this from both of us. This Sweetwater Brewing Company Extra Pale Ale. 420. 420. Ooh, yeah. Um, it was excellent. We both crushed it really quickly. Mine was gone so fast. I got kind of like a sweet tea vibe almost. There was kind of like a little hint of something in there. You were saying it might be the malt? Yeah, I feel like the Extra Pale Ale tends to have more hops than a pale ale, but... Also, more malt forwardness than an IPA. So it might be the perfect blend of our flavor palettes. This might be what we look for as we're trying to make us both happy and a beer moving forward. A sweet middle ground. It's the lucky Pierre between the two of us for <laughs> not the character from the movie. I'm talking yeah. about the, uh, you know, the middle guy in the <laughs> sandwich. I don't know. <laughs> you, don't know, you don't know that no, I don't know that right, reference, that's but that's okay. But I'm, I am excited. Sweetwater was delicious. It yeah. works perfectly. I also like that it is sweet water because our characters uh, say sweet. Yeah, yeah. So, so frequently. So it, connection in there. It works good. So if you have an opportunity to try this, definitely get yourself some Sweetwater Brewing Company. They have a ton of other beers. They have a double IPA 422, which I see that you didn't choose. Uh, right, that one wasn't available. Listen, we're in Canada. Yeah. I don't even know how this ended up here, but we were able to find this somehow in Ontario. Uh, hopefully, they'll get more stuff soon. I would try more beers in this place for sure. It's very tasty. Yeah, me as well. So I'll keep an eye on uh, the SBO for Sweetwater Brewing Company stuff. There you go. Well, next week, uh, speaking of keeping an eye on things, we got a request like almost a year ago from someone on Twitter. And if they've been keeping an eye on our like release schedule and stuff here they're probably like where the f- is my request <laughs> uh, this is long overdue but next week by special request we are going to be taking a look at a little trauma release called chopper chicks in zombie town Ooh, i like zombie movies and who doesn't like a badass on a bike yeah a badass lady on a bike oh Oh, God. (laughs) Uh, Well, yeah, this is going to be, for those of you who don't know, trauma pictures, very low budget, a lot of gore, a lot of kind of schlock. I have never seen this before, but I'm excited. I have seen some other trauma films, and they're always a good time. This might be, I don't want to put any pressure on it, but we might have like a, this could be a high rated episode. Ooh, I'm excited for that. Um, It sounds fun. I do, one of the things that 
I've come to really enjoy because of this podcast is low budget horror. It seems really fun for me and I'm excited to watch that. I think we're going to have a good time. I'm excited to check it out. Before we do, if you haven't already, please follow us on social media at the BMB Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Please feel free to send any suggestions for beers and our movies to those social media accounts or send an email at the BMB Podcast at gmail.com. Absolutely. We always love to hear from you and we hope that you will join us next week for Chopper Chicks and Zombie Town. Until then, I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And we'll see you next time on Bad Movies and Beer. Keep it shibby. Oh, <laughs> After a night they can't remember, comes a day they'll never forget. <laughs> <laughs>